We are going to continue our series through the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 14 today. Just as a, a point of reference, we ended with verse 20 last week, so we're going to pick up in verse 21. And so if you remember last week, um, Paul and Barnabas had journeyed through what we know as central Turkey. They'd visited three cities. They had um, experienced persecution in all three cities, one of them very intensely as Paul was stoned. And um, they, they tried to stone him to death, and um, he didn't die, but they, they thought he was. They left him for dead, and he lived to tell about it. And today we're going to pick up at that point. And um, <clears throat> we're going to cover two chapters, part of 14, all of 15, and part of 16. And I know it's a lot, um, and I'm, I'm, I could go like really in deep, and this could be several sermons, but there's a theme that stretches through all of this, this kind of two-chapter um, uh, section here that I want us to really key upon, and it is the theme of unity and our relationships in ministry. And so we're going to pick up in chapter 14, verse 21. It says, after they had proclaimed the good news in that city, that's the city of Derby. that's the last place on their journey. So they'd gone through these cities, they were in Derby. they proclaimed the good news there, made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, that's the place he was stoned, and to Iconium, and then to Antioch of Pisidian. They strengthened the souls of the disciples, and they encouraged them to continue in the faith saying, we must enter the kingdom of God through many persecutions. I'm going to stop there. So they went back to these cities. I, can, I don't know exactly how much time had passed, maybe a few days, a few weeks, from the time that Paul was run out of this city, having been stoned nearly to death, and he goes to Derby, and now they're coming back. And they're coming back to these cities for the purpose of strengthening the disciples' souls. I love that verbiage, and it makes me ask myself, how do we strengthen one another's souls? What is it that I could do for you or you could do for me that would strengthen your soul? I just think that's an interesting phraseology, but that's what they did. They went back to encourage them, and then it says they went to encourage them to be strong in their faith. And if you were to stop right there and just go partway through that verse, that sounds really nice and sweet, right? Like we went to strengthen them and encourage them. Yay. And then you realize the environment they're in and you finish the sentence. Now we shouldn't imagine that Paul was, was um, stoned there and that he's the only one that had persecution. Odds are, uh, they went to these cities, they evangelized these people, they were raising up disciples, and if those disciples were being faithful to their faith, if they were truly making disciples as they were being sent out to do, they were, in, they were encountering persecution as well. That it wouldn't have stopped with Paul. If Paul isn't immune, why would, why would every other person in town be, amuse, be immune? And so Paul is saying, we went to strengthen them because they needed it because they were being persecuted. And that it would be tempting in the face of persecution to back off, to eject from the situation, to opt out and say, no, thank you, I'd rather not. But he knows that's not the position they're in. And so he knows as he's going, he's strengthening their souls and encouraging their faith because they are right in the teeth of the battle of persecution. You and I probably have not had to experience that. You and I have probably never had that kind of environment. But the fact of the matter is, these people, their faith in Jesus was a very minority view of this larger religious picture that was present in their communities. And the rest of the communities were not favorable to them. And so, Paul and Barnabas wanted to backtrack. They wanted to go back to the places where they themselves had faced persecution, so so that they could encourage them as they walk through persecution. And it says that they did this, and then they went and they appointed elders for the various churches. Through prayer and fasting, they entrusted these churches, these elders, to the protection of the Lord in whom they believed. I love this, that Paul and Barnabas, they care about these churches. They're invested in these churches. They want to see the churches succeed. And so they know, I need to encourage them. I need to strengthen them. We need to help them to persevere in the faith through persecution. But one of the things that's going to help them is to have structure. 
And we kind of take this for granted. You know, this church is about 43 years old. We have an established structure in place of, of authority and how we do church and all those sort of things. But can you imagine for a moment what it would be like to be in a body of believers that like just started last week or a month ago? And everybody's kind of on fire going different directions. There's persecution hitting. There's controversy. There's different people's backgrounds coming in. There's maybe different belief systems being brought to the table. And, and together, in the midst of this sort of amoebic chaos that was the church at that moment, they're trying to figure out, who are we? What do we do now? How do we, how do we respond to this, that? And you can, you can just see how chaos could reign. And it could be a real problem. And so Paul knows one of the most important things he can do is to help them create structure because structure gives strength and strength gives clarity. And so not only does he encourage them, but he brings them together around a structure. Hey, these, these are your elders. They are going to lead you. And, and he provides this setting for them that will give them strength. It will give them organization, like organizedness in the midst of the chaos. And so what he is doing is he is backtracking through these places where he has already been, where his heart is left with these people, but where he himself faced persecution so he can love them well and encourage them well and help give them structure. Well, the rest of chapter 14 is them making the journey then back around to Antioch, where I'm sure they were glad to be home. They rested, kicked their feet up. It says they gave a report of everything that happened. I'm sure there was this great homecoming. And uh, then in chapter 15, it starts with this first sentence, just verse one. It says, now that some men came from Judea, that's Jerusalem, and began to teach the brothers, the fellow Christians, those in the church, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So just for clarity, we have people coming from Jerusalem to Antioch saying, hey, you know, it's okay if you go teach the Gentiles, but if somebody is not circumcised, they're not saved. They must be circumcised. That's what these people are coming and claiming. And so this raises controversy. If you remember back in our series, um, chapter 10 and 11, we had a similar controversy with Peter where he went to the Gentiles, and that in and of itself was controversial. And then we got into like food laws and some of those things that then when they met in chapter 11, they said, you know what, it's okay. Like the Gentiles don't have to eat like we are and those sort of things. Like they sort of smoothed some of those controversial waters. And so you would think like, why are we going back and re rehashing this ground? Didn't we already like, Figure this one out, but circumcision is, is much more sacred. It's much more precious to the Jewish culture than food laws or other areas because this, this was the covenant, the sign of the covenant that God gave to Abraham that was for his familial line that would distinguish Jewish men from Gentile men. This was sacred to them. And so for many of the Jews, as they're trying to figure out where does Judaism stop and where does Christianity begin and how do these work together, for them, this is sacred ground that, that they are not willing to compromise because this distinguishes between people. And as I said, like in some ways, they already, they already covered this ground, but this is a controversy and this is an important one because this person is making a very clear claim that it's salvation plus circumcision in their minds. And so, what do they do? They, they send a delegation of Paul and some other guys down to Jerusalem. And they have what's called the Jerusalem Council. Most of the rest of chapter 15 is the Jerusalem Council, in which they get together the leaders of the capital C church, the apostles, the elders, the, these sort of leaders within the big C church, they get together to, to decide what is it that we are to do with all of these Jewish laws, but specifically circumcision. How does this translate from Judaism to Christianity? This is actually something we can fall into too, this sort of habit or trap of this, where we can have in our past or in our current faith something that's really precious to us, something that maybe has connected deeply with us or something we've always had in our lives growing up, whatever it may be. And we can start to project that onto other people where we can say, um, you know what, it is Jesus, but if you're going to be a really good Christian, you have to do this too. Like this is required that I'm, I'm kind of, whether you like it or not, I am expecting you to do this thing that's important to me too, or to not do this thing. 
That's important to me. And we can, we can easily kind of project these secondary and tertiary things onto other people and make it sort of this expectation or requirement to be faithful. You have to do or not do or whatever it be, this thing. And I want us to be clear. Um, Paul writes the letter of Romans much later in his life, so a couple decades later, and he makes this really clear for us so that we know what salvation requires. Okay, this is Romans chapter 10, verse 9. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. That our faith is a statement of our faith that, that we confess with our mouth, we believe in our hearts that Jesus is who he says he is, that he did for us what he did for us, that we would place our faith in that, that that truth is a truth that we're real willing to rest all the rest of our life on and that the rest of our life will orient around that truth. When we make that proclamation, when we make that statement of faith, we are saved. There is no other things that must be added on. We are to be people of faith, not of law. And it gets dangerous, maybe out of love, maybe out of good intentions, when we start to um, project our own preferences onto other people as requirements for them and their faith. But that's what had happened here. And so they get together, they come, and, and the, the rest of chapter 15 is this Jerusalem council where the leaders get together and they debate, they study, they give arguments back and forth. Uh, Peter and Paul and Barnabas and James all give like little speeches, little arguments, verbal arguments as to what it is they believe, why they believe it. This is the time when Paul sends the letter to the Galatians. So if you go read the book of Galatians and you read chapter 15, they coincide because Paul's got the train, same train of thought going with both of them. And they, they work together to come to this conclusion, to the conclusion that God has been pursuing all of humanity, Jew or Gentile, since Genesis 3. That God has been pursuing all people, and so to, to expect Gentiles to act like Jews would be a step backwards, not a step forward. And they clarify this position. They clarify that this circumcision is not a requirement. They don't forbid it, but it is not a requirement for salvation. They write a letter. They distribute the letter out through Paul back to Antioch, which of course is the second major church at that point in time in Christendom. And, and it will be, as we're going to see here in a minute, distributed then beyond that. But their decision is like a church policy or a church decision position paper where they say circumcision is not required. But they would encourage Christians to abstain from the things that are defiled by idol worship, meaning in that culture people would bring things as a sacrifice to wor the worship of idol food or animals or different things, that once something is brought for idol worship, we don't. We don't uh, uh, engage with that thing. We would not eat it or something like that. Um, to abstain from sexual immorality, that's any kind of sexual anything that's outside of the marriage of one man and one woman. And that we would abstain, abstain from things that are strangled and blood, which is not hard in our culture, but that's what their law said. And so these were the things they put forth, that circumcision is not required, and these things were encouraged to be abstained from. See, we have a faith that is a faith, not a rule book. And the rules, the, the laws that were put in place were meant to facilitate relationship. So it's about a relationship, a, a faith trusting relationship between us and God. And certainly there are rules we should follow, things we should do or not do because they are right or wrong, but it's about our relationship. And that's what they got at is that all people can be included in the church without these extra requirements from the Jewish faith. Now, what I want us to notice here, our key takeaway from this section is this, that in this situation, there was disunity. There was tension around a question, around a debate. And they, the leaders, joined together and they worked through a process, a wise process of research, of debate, of discussion, of prayer, of fasting, to get to a place of unity. They didn't divide. 
They didn't fight. They, they argued. They pushed and pulled, I'm sure, strained back and forth with one another. But they did it in such a way that they got to a place of unity. This is an example for us that because there's more than one of us in this church, we're going to have some tensions. There's going to be some things that we disagree on that maybe we hold differently from one another. And we have to be so committed to unity that when that thing comes up that we disagree, that we will walk through together a process to become unified, to, to come together as one. Now, this is hard for us as Americans because our very independence was based on our independence. We're independent folk. We live here in the Midwest where in many ways we have to be independent to survive out here, especially like a generation or two ago, right? So our independence is one of like our greatest strengths, but it has this, this kind of dark side to it. And it comes out in this saying, and I'm, I'm not going to say it exactly, but I'd rather stand alone and be right than compromise and stand with people. You've heard this, right? I, I'd, rather, I'd rather stand alone and know I'm right. Really? What, what if for the good of, of the group, whatever it is, we should actually come together? We should have some give and take in something. What if, what if this thing that we are so committed to standing alone about is actually not really that important? And so we're actually fracturing and dividing a body over a subject that isn't important. We all know the, the legends of church, churches that have divided over carpet color. Like how ridiculous is that? I mean, really, that a body of Christ would divide over something like that. Did you know there are over 30,000 denominations within the Christian faith? 30,000 denominations, meaning they have found 30,000 different ways to divide us. To say that, you know what, 99.9% .9 of what we believe is the same, but that point one, ah, we've got to go separate ways. Like, oh, how heartbreaking is this? Here's just an easy example. You ready? Okay, so baptism, right? Really important. No arguments about baptism being important. There are those that believe it's required for salvation, those who don't. There are those that believe you can baptize adults. Others say you can baptize kids. Some say you can baptize adults, but you can only baptize adults front ways, not backwards. There are others that say you can baptize them, but you have to submerge them. Others, you have to sprinkle or pour. Others say, nope, you can do submersion, but you have to do it three times. Is any of this in Scripture? Is any of this actually like central to our faith beyond baptism? But yet, like I just defined like a couple hundred denominations right there. This is just mind-blowing to me that we would rather divide than come together. And this passage, this passage shows us what it looks like for a church to come together, to go from disunity to unity, to work through a process of coming together. It's really important. We have to come to church and approach church business, church issues, church topics, whatever it is, with this default position of the we over the me. Because I know me. I like me. I like my opinions. They're really great opinions. But if my opinions fracture us, I'm wrong. We have to champion and value our unity over being right or getting our way. And there are some topics that are worth vigorous debate over and maybe even go in separate ways, but many are not. Many are not. And we have to be wise in knowing when and how and which ones to approach and doing so really well. And this passage gives us a great example of how they did so well. Now, the unfortunate news is the next paragraph, starting in verse 36, is the opposite. It is an example of how not to. In verse 36, after some days back in Antioch, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return to visit the brothers in every town where we had proclaimed the word of the Lord to see how they're doing. Let's go back a third time through Turkey and check on all these churches we planted. Verse 37, Barnabas wanted to bring along John called Mark. Now you remember him from chapter 13? 
13, 13 is when he went back home. He came with them the first time and he left them and went back home. So Barnabas wants to bring him. He's like, let's give him a second shot. But Paul insisted that they should not take along the one who had left them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. They had a sharp disagreement and so that they parted company. Barnabas took along Mark and sailed away to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and set out and commended to the grace of, of the Lord by the fa- brothers and sisters. He passed through Syria and, and Cilicia, strengthened those churches. So one went the sea route and one went the land route. Different ways. I want us to be clear. In this passage, when it says they had a sharp disagreement, the meaning behind that language is the idea of rage and explosiveness. This wasn't a situation where Barnabas is like, hey, we should take Mark. And Paul's like, no, you remember last time? And he's like, no, I really think we should. And he's like, no, I don't think we should. And okay, you take him, you go your way, I'll go my way. That's not how this happened. This was an argument. I picture like yelling, screaming, like they were raging with each other over this decision. Just a few verses ago, we had disunity, that was worked through well to get to unity. Here we have disunity that was not engaged in well and ended up in division, where two men parted ways, two men that had been through a lot together. Can you imagine the bond that existed between these two guys after going through that first missionary journey? And yet they parted ways. The first example, they discussed, they debated, They researched, they prayed, they fasted. The second one, they yelled and screamed. Now, I have to admit, I can fall into this trap too. All of us, there are things we're passionate about, things we care deeply about. There are things that trip our triggers, either good or bad, that then we advocate for (laughs) in maybe some unhealthy ways. My, uh, my fuse is pretty long, but when it's done, it pops. And i be perfectly honest and say, more recent than I would care to admit, I've got to the end of the fuse, and I've handled things wrong, and I've had to go back and make amends. I've had to go back and say, look, I, I, I stand by my position, but how I conducted myself was wrong. I should not have done that. I should not have said that. I should not have whatever. How can we come back together? And that's humbling, like that's hard. But again, if it's about unity, if it's about the we, then when we fall into that trap occasionally, when we are human and we make those kind of human mistakes, we will come back to unity. We will do what's needed to bring what we divided back together. I hope you're not as familiar with that as I am but I suspect probably most of us are. We must value unity. And in this situation, some believe based on the language here that Mark was related to Barnabas. We don't know if that's true or not, but one was advocating for one, one the other. And the result of how they handled it was division. The apostles are examples for us to follow. They are models for us, but they are imperfect models. And in this case, they gave us a bad model to follow. But I think God got the last laugh because whereas there was division, and I'm sure Satan was thrilled about that, God got two missionary pairs out of the deal, not just one. And my guess is that both were pretty good at what they did. (laughs) And when they went their separate ways, they made a huge impact for the church. But let's, let's not overlook the fighting for the unity of the church and how to do that well or not well. Now, as we go into chapter 16, I want to recall back to last week, last week, um, We talked about these three communities that they went through, and in one, they had opposition, and they went, and another, they had opposition, and they stayed. And we asked the question last week, how do you know when to go and when to stay? You remember that? And we decided that as best we could tell from Scripture that the way you know whether to come or go 
at a place is through prayer. By going to the Lord and saying, Father, what should we do? Should we go? Should we stay? And remember, I, I made this sort of uh, question that who, who was saved because they stayed that wouldn't have been? Or who was saved because they went and over here from here and somebody was, was um, impacted here who wouldn't have been if they'd have stayed, right? And remember, I asked that question, like I said, we'll never know. We kind of do know. Look in verse six, or chapter 16. Also in Derby, and they came to Derby and then Lystra, and a disciple named Timothy was there, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer and whose father was a Greek. The brothers in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, and Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews were because of the Jews who were in the places they were going, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Okay. So here's Timothy. Would Timothy have been reached if they had not come or gone when they listened to the Lord to do so? If they had decided on their own accord to go or to stay? We don't know, right? Because we don't know the whole circ- circumstances of events and the whole, the whole I don't, we don't know. But here's what I would like to, 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 to point out. That God knows what he's doing. We think we do. And in this case, for all we know, If they had gone against God's will and not gone or stayed when they should have, they might have missed Timothy. And Timothy now goes with them and accompanies them on these missionary journeys. He has left to be a pastor of one of the most significant churches in the the European area and ends up having two books of the Bible written to him. In first service, I said he wrote them. That's wrong. Paul wrote them to him, first and second Timothy. We would have missed, potentially, all of this blessing if Paul and Barnabas had not listened to God and had come or gone when they wanted to, not when God wanted them to. And so here we have Timothy. But you notice, I just read by something interesting um, that happened to Timothy. Did you catch it? Did you catch the, the irony in verse uh, 3? What was the argument in chapter 15 all about? Circumcision. What was the decision At the end of chapter 15, that it's not required. What was Paul's argument in all this? That it shouldn't be required. And in fact, in Galatians, when he wrote to them in chapter 5, Paul says that if you um, are circumcised, Christ is of no value to you. And then later he writes a letter to the Corinthians where where he says in chapter 7, this is 1 Corinthians, if someone is uncircumcised when he comes to faith, he should remain uncircumcised. And then in chapter 16, Paul takes Timothy and circumcises him. What's happening, Paul? What's up here? You can't have it both ways, can you? Paul just did, actually. Here's what happened. You notice in chapter 15, verse 1, they're talking about circumcision being required. And the decision at the end of 15 was that it's not required. They didn't speak against it. You can still be circumcised if you'd like to be. But it's not required anymore. Now, Paul does speak against it pretty strongly in his letters, right? But notice Paul tells us why he asks Timothy to be circumcised. It's because the communities they're going to minister to, the ones that are around where Timothy grew up, the people there are Jewish. And those Jewish people know he has a Greek father. And Paul believes that by Timothy being circumcised, he will be more effective in the ministry to these people. So this brings us back to chapter 10 and chapter 11, where we started this series, where we have a gate in front of us. Timothy has a gate He's not required to walk through this gate. He could have said, no, thank you. I'd rather not be circumcised. But Paul is saying, Timothy, I think that if you want your ministry to these people to be the most effective that it can be, you need to walk through this gate and you need to be circumcised. Again, it goes back to this principle we've talked about all the way through this this series, and that is that ministry starts with the people you're trying to reach. Paul believes that if we're going to reach them well, if we're going to minister to them well, Timothy, I'm sorry. This is what I think you should do. And Timothy agrees. Now, we can all agree, that's a painful gate. That's not like a preferential kind of, oh, I guess I'll do that kind of gate. Like, that's a, that's a, that's a sacrificial gate. But Timothy is so committed to the mission. He's so committed to making sure 
that it's successful and that these people can hear the gospel and that there's nothing as a stumbling block or an intrusion standing in the way that they wouldn't dare be able to point a finger back at him to compromise the message and the gospel he's trying to deliver that he says, okay. And he does it. He, for their sake, for unity with them, for effectiveness with them, he is circumcised. All of this little section is all about unity. It's all about how we need to come together, how we need to be unified to minister well. We started with strengthening and encouraging one another, especially when persecution or, or our faith is assaulted that we need to help lift one another up. We start, went to with church structure and appointing elders, and then ways decisions are made with the Jerusalem council. And then the very decision itself is that Christianity is as simple as faith. It's all about relationship, not about rules. We saw a process walked out where they debated, they discussed, they prayed through, they researched all those things through and made a decision to come together to take disunity to unity. And we saw the bad example of doing it wrong and disunity to division. And now we see somebody who is making a sacrifice so that other people can more easily be unified into the family of God. All of this is about unity. One thing we, we cannot lose sight of as a church is that Satan loves division. He loves it. And there's nothing that he would love more than to see churches divide. He loves the fact that there's 30,000 different denominations in, in the world right now. He loves it. And he is at work in every church, including ours, saying, how do I plant a seed of doubt here? How do I take this little tiny crack and just tap a little wedge in there and see how wide I can make it? How do I take this little grudge, this little disagreement, how can I blow it up? How can I take these preferences and make them big deals? How can I convince this person this insignificant thing is something worth causing division over? He's loving his work in dividing the church. And Jesus made it very clear. His final prayer was one of unity. And, and he told us in Matthew 12, that he says, every kingdom divided against itself is destroyed, that no town, no house divided against itself will stand. Satan knows that he's trying to divide us. He knows that if he can simply divide us, we'll fall apart. And so we, if we're wise, if we're discerning, Christians, church members, we will work the opposite to bring things together. We will give each other grace. We will compromise when we can. We may have a position that we disagree with something, we'll state it, but we'll do so appropriately in the right times, in the right places, in the right ways, that we will work hard to come together so the church is unified for the sake of the ministry, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of making disciples all around us, we will come together, not pull apart. If we are going to be successful, we have to get good at this. We have to practice it often. Again, there's more than one of us here, so it's going to happen. So we have to be committed to we more than me and keep us together unified. That's our takeaway today. And one of the things that we do here often is communion. And we do it because it unifies us. It reminds us of what is central, of what is uncompromisable. And so, as the gentlemen bring uh, the elements forward, I would ask that you take the elements. There's two cups. They're stacked on top of each other. One is the drink. One is the bread. I actually have one right over here. Thank you, though, Zach. Yeah. Uh, they're gluten-free in the middle if you need that. As you take these, I hope that they are reminders to you <clears throat> of what it is we believe. They represent the gospel, the body and the blood of Jesus. But it also is a reminder to us of all the other things that come in second or third or tenth or a hundredth place. And so my prayer is, is that as you receive your elements, you'll spend just some time with God, praying through the el these elements, but also maybe praying through some other things that have come too close to number one and bringing those in reflection of the gospel. So go ahead and do that.